Hi, I'm Peter Wheelhauer, and today I want to talk about political parties, and in particular, the two-party system that we have here in the United States. A lot of people wonder and are frustrated by the fact that we have only two major political parties that really are running the show, and so I think it's worth taking some time to understand why that happens. I recorded this in two different locations. One is in front of a class, and the other is in my office in order to fill in some gaps that I saw in my first presentation. That probably means that the audio you're going to hear at different points is going to change a bit and sound different. I apologize for that, uh, but hopefully that this will all work out and uh, you'll learn a lot from this particular presentation. One of the most important things to remember is that when we're talking about the number of political parties that we see in a country, is that the number of political parties depends itself on the rules of the game in that part, in that country. So it could be that a country has a constitution that talks about political parties, or it may just have a system of government that's set up in a way that creates uh, incentives for people to pursue multiple political parties or that constrain people's activities with regard to parties. The most important thing for us to know is that the rules structure the competition. That is, they set the framework within which political competition and representation occurs, and that those rules have specific set of consequences that we can identify. And a big part of what we'll talk about in this presentation is the way those rules work. Another part of understanding the rules is that they actually aren't just kind of designed to create a particular political system. The major parts of our political rules were set up well before, uh, uh, well before we had political parties the way that we understand them today. So it wasn't that they were designed to create political parties. It's just that when we see these rules in place, the result is that a particular set of political parties and kind of party system results. The rules themselves are actually mostly intended to facilitate representation of different kinds of groups in society, interest groups, affinity groups, economic groups, and geographic groups. Now, when we look at democracies around the world, we see that there are two major forms of party systems in representative democracies. So we're not talking about countries with only one functioning political party, or we're not talking about a dictatorship where the dictator is a the head of the party and the party is the only way to succeed in a country. We're not talking about monarchies where political competition for in the legislature isn't anything like a real democratic system. So here we're talking about a representative democracy, and we're talking about two kinds of systems that emerge. One is a two-party system in which two parties are dominant, and another is multi-party system where multiple parties have representation in the government. Both systems have their strengths and weaknesses, and they achieve representation for the people in different ways. So I think it's worth looking at how these two, uh, these two sets kinds of representation occur. And the most effective way I can think about thinking about talking about this is in the importance of coalitions for politics. You know, politics is about coming to agreement and getting a group of people to agree to do something, whether it's to elect a candidate or a set of candidates, or whether it's to uh, pass a bill in a legislature, coalitions are important. So let's look at that for a moment. We're going to compare these two systems of coalition building as a way of helping us understand the way that the two party systems produce representation. On the left, let's think about this as being like the United States. When we think about coalition building in the United States, coalitions really occur between the people and the government. It's not so much that the coalitions occur in the government, it's that the people work together to form groups. And some people take the time and the energy to form groups, and they find that they have some things in common. And then in order to get their voice heard, they have to organize somehow. And so people within a population form coalitions and these coalitions then act as entities and organizations to elect other people to office in the representative system. So you can see here that people from all over the country uh, have common ways of thinking about politics and the way the role, the appropriate role of government. Now, what's interesting is that we, when we look at coalitions in this way, it turns out that in the United States, in the American experience, coalitions have always seemed to work this way. 
Political scientist James Reichley, for example, in his book Life of the Parties, makes the argument that broad coalitions kind of forming two large sets of opinions have always been a part of our system for even from the colonial periods. So what happens is that these people then organize. They say, we want to try to work together in order to elect somebody to office to represent our coalition. And so somebody takes the time and energy to do that organization. These are political entrepreneurs. They could be opinion leaders in the community. But eventually what happens is the coalitions among the people elect people to go into office. And so those people hold elections. Some of them win some of them lose. But then when you get to office, then you have a group of people who have been elected by and large by Coalition 1, and a group of people who have been elected by and large from Coalition 2, and those governing coalitions then work in office. And we just call those political parties. So when you have only two competitive political parties in a system, almost certainly you're going to have one party that at any given point in time has a majority in the legislature. So governing coalition two might have 52% of the seats, governing coalition one might have 48% of the seats, the governing coalition two gets to govern. The thing is that within that party, they don't have to do a ton of negotiation. There's obviously some that goes on, but really that's a coalition that was voted on and elected to office by the voting coalition underneath it. And so they have a, a sense of loyalty and representation for the people in their coalition. The people in coalition, governing coalition one, they were voted from the popular coalition one. And so the representation occurs for these groups. The difference is that it takes place at, the, at a lower level. The coalition building takes place there, and then the coalitions get get partisans elected to office. And so then we could replace these words governing coalition with political parties. On the other hand, when we look at a different kind of system, say perhaps if we look at Germany or we look at Israel or we look at other kinds of uh, representative systems, what happens is that you have groups in those systems that have particular interests. So you've got a small chunk of people and they say, we want to get representation in the government. And so they take advantage of the way the rules are written in their country and they are able to elect a small number of people to go to represent that group in government. And then you have another group that says, we want to elect our group, our group's representatives too. And so they elect a chunk of people to go represent them. And all across the country, these chunks of voters elect representatives to, the off, to office that represent their particular narrow interests. So the red group here and the purple group, they're pretty narrow. The green group and the blue group, they're a little bit broader. And so you have large groups in the government and small groups in the government. But these representatives then come out of narrow chunks of the population. So now the problem is that you have to do some governing. And in every representative democracy, because it's largely representation and lawmaking, it's largely based on majority rule, the coalition building then has to take place in the government. And so what happens is members of these different parties coalesce together to create some kind of a governing coalition. And so the leaders of the political parties, the political elites who have been elected, they agree to cooperate with each other in order to get laws passed. So if we look at governing coalition two here, it might be that they end up with no one party having a majority, but with the blue party having the largest chunk, they're able to work with the purple and the green party in order to cobble together maybe a 52 or 55 percent majority in the in the uh, government, and then red, orange, and yellow parties are their shot out because they're not then part of the governing coalition. In both sets of systems of representation, I want you to see that coalition building takes place. In the two-party system, it tends to take place at the party and grassroots level. Coalition building takes place at the elite level when you're dealing with the representation system too. Functionally, these then are what is going on in a two-party system and a multi-party system. So then let's look at the ways that laws facilitate representation, especially as we think about the two-party system here in the United States.
So here's the basic scenario that we have in terms of looking at the American two-party system. When we look at all the members of Congress and we look at all of the members of state legislatures, we look at all of the governors, and we look at all the other offices all over the country that are not those offices but might be city council members or county commission members or drain commissioners or coroners or whatever people vote on, dog catcher. When we take all those offices and we sort them by political party, 98% of the offices are won by people who are either Democrats or Republicans. And only 2% are won by people who are neither Democrat nor Republican. So a green candidate, a libertarian candidate, Democratic Socialist candidate, those particular political parties, they only capture 2% of all partisan elected offices across the country. And it's not new. This has been the case for decades and decades. Moreover, when we look at presidential elections, there's only one third party or one minor party that has won the presidency. And that was in 1860. Do you remember who won the presidency of 1860? Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, so Abraham Lincoln in the Republican Party, that was a brand new party. The Republicans were only four years old in 1860, and they managed to win the presidency. But there has, that's the first time in U.S. history, and the only time in U.S. history, that a third or a minor party has, uh, has won the presidency. In 1856 to 1860, the Republicans were not a dominant party. They were a new party that originally started called the Free Soil Party. And so the two major parties at the time were the Democrats and the Whigs. And then in the election of 1860, the Democrats maintained and the Whigs disintegrated. So, and the Republicans took their place. But that's the only time that the president uh, has been elected from a third or a minor party. Moreover, as we saw the other day, when we look at the political parties themselves, that they're made up of a mishmash, a very diverse set of different kinds of groups with different kinds of goals that they might want to be pursuing. So you might have libertarians within the Republican Party, um, or you might have people who are only about uh, LGBT rights in the Democratic Party. Um, and so you look at those by themselves, those groups aren't succeeding politically, but within the context of a political party, they are in the US system. So we have these two parties that are made up of a very diverse mishmash of other groups, both the Democrats and the Republicans. So what? Who cares? So let's take a moment and think about that for a second. As political scientists have studied this question of why we have two political parties, they've come up with uh, several different answers. And this is mostly done through comparing countries that have two political parties dominating their political environment with countries that have many political parties active and viable in their political environment. And so political scientists have compared those countries to see what the key differences seem to be and then done statistical analysis to find out if these impressions actually are, are broad and robust patterns that exist over time and across different kinds of systems. And we've identified really one, two, three, four, five different uh, principles that help us to discern or predict whether countries will have a two-party system versus a multi-party system. So we're going to frame this question in terms of why you end up, why countries end up with two-party systems. And the first one in the United States case is simply our political culture. That over time, research shows that even though we now seem to have these two broad political competitive parties, then in fact that's nothing new. The two broad political coalitional parties have existed since the founding of the Republic. And in fact, research into the politics of the colonial governments showed that even in the colonies, well before the American Revolution, there were really, in each state, there were really two broad um, political coalitions. They weren't 
We won't call them Democrats and Republicans because those parties didn't exist at the time. But when you look at the politics of the day, they broadly sorted themselves out into two broad camps. So this is a relatively new as or a relative endure, relatively enduring aspect of America of American politics that goes into our colonial period. The second thing, more broadly comparing internationally, is that in countries where you have an independently elected chief executive, like our president, those kinds of countries tend to have end up with two political parties. Whereas countries where people elect a legislature and the legislature elects the chief executive, those kind of countries are, are much more likely to be multi-party countries. So the argument is that there's some kind of a dynamic in the campaigns and in the national politics of countries where the people have a direct say in terms of who becomes the chief executive. Whereas in countries where they don't have that direct say, then you're much less likely to end up with two political parties. A third major factor as we look at the, the reasons that we have two political parties, again, this mostly comes from studying the United States, but also looks at other countries that have two parties versus multi parties. And in general, um, the United States has state laws and federal laws that give an advantage to the two middle major political parties. And the logic here is pretty straightforward. If you're currently benefiting from the set of a certain set of rules, then you have an incentive to keep those rules. And in fact, you might have incentives to pass rules and to create laws that maintain that advantage over time. So when we look at Democrats and Republicans, they control the state legislatures. The state legislatures make the laws regarding how elections are run at the state level. Given that, they are really less likely to pass laws that are going to benefit some other political party. In fact, we can see that Democrats tend to pass laws that, that benefit Democrats and Republicans pass laws that benefit Republicans. But when they get together, they pass laws that benefit Democrats and Republicans and make it harder for small parties, smaller groups to win politically. So they make it more difficult to get on the ballot, for example. You, people can't vote for you if you're not on the ballot. And so the general law in most states is the Democrats automatically get their candidate on the ballot. Why? Because they consistently are competitive. The Republicans automatically get their candidate on the ballot because pretty consistently they're competitive. But if you're a Green Party candidate or a Libertarian Party candidate or a U.S. Taxpayers Party candidate, or a natural law party candidate. The laws in most states require you to get a very large number of petitions signed in order to get on the ballot and pay a fee to get your name on the ballot. So that's called a filing fee. Whereas the Republicans and the Democrats, they don't have to pay those fees. They don't have to get a whole bunch of signatures to get on the ballot. So who made such a rule? Well, it was the Democrats and the Republicans who make the laws. So that's an example of a kind of situation in which the people who regularly gain power write laws to help them maintain that power. And so that makes it harder for small parties to get on the ballot. Another factor is really simple. That's not based on law at all. It's based on simple socialization. As we talked about in the past, Parents who are Democrats tend to end up with adult kids who are Democrats. Parents who are Republicans tend to end up with adult kids who are Republicans. So the idea of that party connection gets passed down from generation to generation. And that's a socialization thing. That has nothing to do with anybody changing laws or monkeying around with the laws at all. It just has to do with the way that family values get passed on from parents to kids. Those are a remarkable degree of consistency in countries that have these laws and, and have these histories. But the two most important factors that predict whether a country is going to have 
two parties or multiple parties in their political environment are having single member districts and using the plurality rule for deciding who wins elections. So we're gonna take some time and we're gonna look at both of these factors, single member districts and the plurality rule. So we're gonna take time and look at each one of these factors. Single member districts is the system of representation that many, country use, many countries use. So in the case of the United States, as an example, each state gets a certain number of representatives. We talked about this when we covered the Constitution. The state then is divided into geographic districts, specific geographic areas, and then each one of those geographic areas um, elects a single member to represent that area in Congress. So we divide up Michigan into 14 different geographic areas. We call those congressional districts. And then each one of those districts has an election to pick a person, a single person, to go represent that district. That's called a single member district system. This is modeled act actually after the British parliamentary system. By the way, almost all the states in the US have almost always used this exact system. In the British parliamentary system, even at the colonial period, the basic idea was of individual representatives being elected from towns or geographic areas called constituencies. And so even today, that's the case in the British parliamentary system. And in this case, the system of representation was adopted by the United States and by virtually all of the other British colonies. So we see that British colony, former British colonies like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, they are all very likely to use single member district systems. The second major factor is the plurality rule. This is known in some countries around the world as the first past the post rule. And the basic idea here is that when you're trying to figure out who wins the election, the winner is the person who gets the most votes. It does not have to be a majority. So in this system, you look at all the candidates, you count up all the votes that are cast, and whoever gets the most votes wins the election. This would be a different system than, say, using a majority system. In a majority rule system, then you count all the votes that are cast, and whoever gets an absolute majority, 50% plus one, they win the election. But that's not what we have. Because if you have a third party that is running and takes some votes away from one of the major political parties, then it could be that your winner gets less than a majority of the vote. And in fact, that's what we see a lot of the time in the United States. And then this is also different from what might be called proportional representation system, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, in which political parties win representation based upon how well they do in the overall vote. So if a political party wins, say, 60% of the vote in a, in a state, then they would get 60% of the seats that are available. A party that wins 40% of the vote gets 40% of the seats. So they, get win, they win some of the representation. That's a proportional representation system. These two characteristics, single member district system and the plurality rule, are extremely good predictors of whether a country, whether a whole a political system will end up with two major political parties or many political parties. And when they have these two characteristics, almost always there are two major political parties that are viable and then very few viable other parties. So I want to walk you through what this looks like. How does that function? Before I go on, do you have questions about my basic explanation of those? Okay. So in this case, we're gonna have a hypothetical state. This is our state, and we have a bunch of congressional, we have a bunch of legislative districts that are drawn. And we're gonna hold a bunch of elections in each of those, and we got five different political parties that are running. We've got the Broncos, the Spartans, University of Michigan, Chippewas, and the Lakers. So we look at the first congressional district, and in that district, we hold an election. So this is a single member district system. We've got a state that has been carved up. It's, 
it's been allocated 10 seats, and the state has been carved up into 10 different districts, just like we have in the United States system. In District 1, we look at the vote, and the Broncos win 43% of the vote, and the Spartans win 38% of the vote. University of Michigan makes, gets 15%, the loser Chippewas get 3% of the vote, and the Lakers get 1% of the vote. Who wins? The one that wins a, a plurality of the vote. If there were only two parties, we know somebody would get a majority. And in this situation, it's possible that some party could get a majority of the vote and, and the other parties would split up and divide the rest of the vote. But in this case, we have a plurality rule. So a winner doesn't need a majority. They just need to win more than anybody else. So in this case, the Broncos, the Broncos candidate wins the plurality. And so they win the seat that's available. The other parties, even the one that won 38% of the vote, they get none of the seats. There's only one seat available. So this party wins one, the others win zero. So far, so good. This is the system we use in the United States. So it should be fairly familiar to kind of the way we run things. I do want you to notice that 57% of the people who voted in the election did not vote for the winner. So the winner won with 43% of the vote. That means that 57% of the people did not vote for the person who actually ends up representing them. Now let's look at District 2. In District 2, we have a slightly different system because the lines have been drawn differently. We've got different pockets of population. And so the Bronco Party candidate wins 35%. The Spartan Party wins 52%. That's for my son because he's a Spartan fan. Michigan fan, uh, Michigan vote was 2%. Chippewas did 9% and the Lakers did 2%. Okay, who wins? The Spartan Party, right? In this case, she happened to win a majority of the vote, 52% of the vote. She gets the one seat. The other people do not get the seat. The other parties do not get the seat. We look again at District 3. In District 3, which is a slightly different di district, Broncos win 51%, Sparty's 27 Michigan 1, Chippewa's 18 and the Lakers 3%. Who wins? The Bronco, right? So again, they get a seat. Everybody else doesn't. Now, we do this over and over again, of course, for every district, because every district gets to elect its member. And when we do this over time, the characteristics of this particular state mean that the Broncos and the Spartans are they're really the two competitive parties in the system. Everybody else has some places where they do better and wor or worse, but nobody, none of the other parties, parties actually manage to get enough votes to win one of the seats. So what we end up with is a, a, a state with 10 different congressional districts, and six of them go to the Broncos, and four of them go to the Spartans. It's the statewide vote, 44% of the people in the state vote for the Bronco, 32% vote for the Spartan. Okay? But what percentage of the seats go to the Broncos? 60 so the Broncos win 44% of the votes, but gain 60% of the representation. In terms of the Spartans, they win 40% of the vote, 40, I'm sorry, 32% of the vote, and gain 4% of the, 40% of the representation. When we look at the other parties, though, the Michigan party had 11% of the vote, they get nothing. Chippewas, they won 10%, they get nothing. And the Lakers, they won 3%, and they also get nothing. So what you actually have then is 66% of the people in the state end up with 100% of the representation. 36% of the, is that right? 70, I'm sorry, 26%. Sorry, 26% of the people voted for somebody for a political party that gets no seats in the legislature. So we do the math on this, depending on what you think is right and just, on an individual basis, seems, looks like it's pretty fair, but some people don't like this system because when you add it all up, the seats are somewhat disproportionate. The representation doesn't seem just, given a set of, of apparently just outcomes. In the aggregate, it feels, to a lot of people, unjust in terms of using this particular system. 
But look at what happens over the long haul. How long is the Laker party going to survive? They are not going to survive long because they can keep running, but they are going to keep losing. What would be better for the Lakers to do? So let's say the Lakers have a particular issue they care about. Like, let's say it's about marijuana legalization, all right? If they have this one issue that, that is really mobilizing them, they know that politically they cannot possibly win. What is their best strategy for getting marijuana legalization to be enacted? They form a coalition with one of the bigger parties. So then one of these two parties then incorporates the Laker party into it. And its members more or less agree that they're going to vote for that one political party. So that actually enhances the competitiveness and viability of one of the major parties, and you eliminate a small party. Okay? That improves the chances of these parties gaining majorities in each of these districts. So for example, we're looking at 51% here, but if you take that Lakers 3% and they go to the Broncos, then they get 54% of the vote. That, that's more of a, a better outcome for the Broncos. It's better to win by 54 than 51, even though you win the one seat any anyway. And what happens is that actually these other minor parties, they face the same set of incentives. Even though they represent 10% of the population, their best option for actually gaining a voice and representation in the system is to form a coalition with one of the major parties. Because if they don't, they're just going to keep running and running and running and spending money and expending energy and losing and losing and losing and losing. And after a while, they fade away or get absorbed. And in fact, this is exactly what we see happens in two-party systems. Small movements grow up. And then after a little while, they fade away, but their issue tends to be adopted by one of the major parties. And this happens over and over and over again. It's happened in our history as well. So when we look at Green Party candidates who are really focused on the environment, the Green Party itself is not viable to win offices in most places in the United States. And so what we see is that many people who vote Green morph toward the Democratic Party because that's a political party that is more amenable to the Green Party agenda than the Republican Party. So this happens, and it has happened in U.S. history many times. Questions? So what's the alternative? The alternative is what most democracies do. This is the basic pattern used by virtually every former British colony. They use the single member district system. Let's use a different system. Let's say we have the same state, same state, only now instead of carving up that state into 10 different districts, instead we're, they get the same 10 seats. But instead what we're going to do is we're going to award representation based upon how well the parties do in the election. And we're going to really oversimplify this and just say that the party representation that we saw in the previous slide in terms of the percentage of the vote won statewide, that's also what happens in this hypothetical situation, even though it wouldn't work that way. But let's just, for the sake of comparison, hold that constant. Same statewide vote. The Bronco Party in this system where we have proportional representation. This is called a multiple member district, by the way. The whole state is considered to be a multiple member district instead of each district being considered a single member district. Same percentage votes from the previous slide, 44, 32, and so forth. But now we have a new set of rules for deciding who wins the elections. So in the state, then, you have the number of seats that you win is basically a function of getting reaching a certain threshold of the vote and then figuring out what percentage of the seats you get based upon the percentage of the votes that you win. So you win 44% of the vote, you should get roughly 44% of the seats. 32, you should get roughly 32% of the seats. That's proportional representation. You win representation in proportion to how well you do. So in this system, as long as you win at least 10% of the vote, then you get some representation. And every country in the world that uses this kind of a system has some kind of a threshold. 
the threshold varies from country to country. Some countries it's 5%, some countries it's 15%, but every country that uses the system has a threshold. So this is gonna make our math easy. We're gonna make it a 10% threshold. Bronco Party won 44% of the votes statewide, so they get automatically 4%, I mean four of the 10 seats, 40% of the seats. The Spartans, they got 32% of the votes, so they get three, 32, roughly 30% of the seats that are available. Michigan Party, they won 11%, so they hit that 10% threshold, so they get a seat. Same thing with the Chippewa Party, poor Lakers Party, they're still out in the cold because they didn't hit the threshold. They've got some support, but not enough to win this time. Then oftentimes these systems have a bonus system. So whichever party wins the most seats wins a little bit more. So they get a bonus because you've got 10 seats to allocate, but in the initial allocation, you've only allocated nine. What do you do with that last seat? And so you give it to the winner of the overall state. So then in the proportional representation system, what you end up with is a system where the Broncos win 44% of the seats and they win, I'm sorry, 44% of the vote and they end up with 50% of the representation. Spartans win 32% of the vote and they end up with 30% of the representation. 11% of the vote, 10% of the representation, 10% of the vote, 10% of the representation and so forth. We compare that to the single member district system Compare that with 60% versus 50%, 40 versus 30, 0, 0, 0, 0. This is why political parties often, or, or political minority parties oftentimes want to change the rules. But who makes the rules? The Republicans and the Democrats. Because the people who are in power are the parties that win, right? And so in the system that we currently have, the winners then make the rules. But wait, let's go back to the Lakers party. Under the single member district system, the Lakers party had no hope ever of winning any votes. But over, say, maybe the next 10 years with good planning, good communication, could they achieve 10% from 3%? Yeah. They could, right? We see this in countries around the world. So over the last 10 years, for example, neo-Nazi groups in Germany, previously virtually unwinnable, they've been able to cobble together small minority votes, enough votes to hit those thresholds in those areas. And so they then are winning seats in the German legislature under a system like this. That's the bad side of things, right? Because it could be the neo-Nazis, right? But it could be the other side. It could be the group that you love but is really unrepresented. Pick your favorite group, whatever your issue is, that you love, is very you're committed to, but that would have very minority support in the public, right? In this system, you have incentive to organize and build because you could get to that threshold. And you don't have to win a plurality. You don't have to win a majority. You just have to get enough to get one seat. And your voice is clearly and specifically represented in the government. Whereas under a single member district system, it's much less likely that that's going to occur. Yes. How, how, how do people run then? So how many, if there's 10 seats, do 10 Democrats run and only four or five of them would get it? If, if they were running and only 10% won, would only one get it? If one of them were running, like how, how do you decide who gets what seat? This is where the rules vary a lot from country to country. The basic process for getting for the operating this system is that the, the power moves from individual candidates to the political parties. So in this kind of a system, the political parties, they choose who the individuals will be who win. So they put what this is called a, this is often called a list system. So each of the political parties puts together a list of candidates for office. And then when the votes are divided, then the party gets to choose from that list of candidates who they're representing, who is going to go win. Sometimes the voters get a choice so they can vote for a political party. They might vote for the Labor Party. And then within the list of candidates for the Labor Party, then they might vote for candidate A, B, or C. And then the party takes that under advisement or something like that. But the power in this system really resides with the political parties who 
decide who the candidates are going to be. And the candidates themselves are less important in the United States. It's the candidates who decide whether they're going to run, under what party label they're going to run, because the political parties don't do a lot in terms of of uh, deciding who will who will run. It's entirely an individual motivation. Yeah. That's what we had in the previous slide. Okay. The previous okay. slide was based upon a state where we had this and we used a single member district system. The Bronco Party got six seats, even though they only won 44% of the vote. Okay, because I didn't understand how fitting this was just Right, this is just pulling these numbers from the previous slide. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Okay. This pattern has a name. This was discovered and elaborated by a French political scientist in the 1950s. I don't remember what his first name is, but his last name was Duverger. So this is called Duverger's Law. It's the closest thing to a completely predictable situation in all of political science. It's pretty close. What Duverger discovered? is that in countries with single member district systems and plurality rules, nearly always produce two broad political parties everywhere in the world that the system is used. When he was writing in the 1950s, the only example that he was able to come up with of a system that used a single member district system and did not have a two party system was India. All the other systems in the world that use this had ended up with a two-party system. And sometimes you end up with a, with a meaningfully competitive third party, but that was very rare. Most of the time, you just end up with two major political parties. Because, as we talked about, smaller parties in the single-member district system, plurality system, they lose repeatedly and eventually get absorbed into one of the two major parties. They advantage the creation of broad coalitions like we have with our Democrats and Republicans like we saw the other day. Broad coalitions. And when we look at how this works in the United States, nearly every single office in the United States uses some form of the single member district plurality rule system. We have a few exceptions in southern states where a candidate has to win an absolute majority of the vote. But for the most part, most places around the country for the more than 500,000 elective offices that we have in the United States use this, this kind of a system. And that strengthens the tendency for Republicans or Democrats to win and small parties to not win on a large scale systematic basis. Uh, look, occasionally a non-Democrat, non-Republican will win. So Bernie Sanders from Vermont was elected as a socialist. Okay. But he's rare, right? It's that he's the exception rather than the rule. Jesse the Body Ventura, the professional wrestler from the 1970s and 1980s, he ran as an independent and became governor of Minnesota. But that was mainly because he won a plurality. He won like 36% of the vote, whereas the Democrats and the Republicans, they just couldn't get up to that. They won like 33 and 34% of the vote. So it's not like he won a majority, but he was that one candidate who was able to win a, an independent. So the vast majority of cases, you end up with a Democrat or Republican winning in this case because the parties are broad coalitions. Countries that use multiple member districts and proportional representation systems produce multiple parties everywhere the system is used. So single member district and plurality systems produce two parties almost everywhere it's used, but proportional representation systems with multiple member districts, they produce multi-party systems everywhere that they use. The smaller parties can win, and because of that, they can gain some representation. So I'm less likely to disband as a party if I actually hold a seat in parliament. My party does that, and then it gives me the ability to gain some leverage. Proportional representation rules, they advantage small factions. So imagine a political party that was only about marijuana legalization, right? They could win 
a representation, a seat representing them, or maybe multiple seats, depending on how well they do. But if it's a really narrow issue, that group has some incentive to run and stay viable and independent of the major political parties. So anyway, this is called Duberger's Law. And it works almost all the time. Questions? So I hope that all of that has helped you to understand why we have a two-party system here in the United States. The most important factor is that, that we have a single-member district system for electing representatives to government. We also use the plurality rule for deciding our elections. This is the most important factor. These are the two most important factors for determining whether or not any government is going to predominantly have a two-party system or a multi-party system. It helps that we have independently elected chief executives, both at the national level and at the state level. That helps to focus our attention and keep competition simple. The ballot access laws make do make it harder for uh, small parties to get on the ballot and maintain their competitiveness over a long period of time. Our political culture, from a historical perspective, seems to be one in which we have these two large coalitions kind of built into our political DNA, in which we tend to think about politics in terms of us versus them. That's not required in every culture. It just happens to be the kind of culture that we happen to be in. And then finally, political socialization matters as well.